This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries, four eerie tales for All Hallows' Eve. The legend of the gray man. For more than a century, this solitary ghost has wandered the sand dunes of a tiny island in South Carolina. Some residents claim that his ghostly appearances protected their homes from the fury of Hurricane Hugo. Halloween 1988, 29-year-old David Stone embarked on a bizarre spiritual journey across the New Mexico desert. He left behind a trail of baffling clues and then mysteriously vanished. Eyewitnesses claim that this woman possesses remarkable psychic abilities, both mental and physical, an extraordinary case of paranormal powers or a brilliant deception. We'll also bring you an intriguing update on our last season's story about reincarnation. Can we truly experience a past life or is it all in the mind? Join me. It's Halloween night on Unsolved Mysteries. Traditionally in Halloween ghost stories, ghosts are described as frightening entities. But on a tiny island in South Carolina, they tell of a very different kind of spirit. Over the last 170 years, five deadly hurricanes have ripped through Pawleys Island. Every single one of these storms has been accompanied by a local sighting of a ghost known as the Gray Man. In a bizarre coincidence, apparently every person who has encountered the ghost has been spared from harm. Fairy tale, or evidence that ghosts do exist. The record may speak for itself. The legend of the Gray Man began in the late summer of 1822. Along the dunes of a deserted beach on tiny Pawleys Island, a wealthy young planter rode with his manservant on a mission of the heart. His destination was his fiancée's plantation, the wedding was just days away, but the groom was overcome with youthful emotion and impatience. By the time he could be pulled out of the marsh, it was too late. The young man was dead. At the plantation, the bride-to-be heard the tragic news. Rachel. Yes, Papa? It's James. He was riding. He fell in the marsh. He died in the fall. According to the legend, the girl took to wandering the shore alone, contemplating a life she no longer had reason to live. One afternoon, she discerned a shadowy form standing in the sands. That night, her betrothed whispered an urgent warning. Flee the island. The wind is coming. The wind. She and her parents left the next day, just before a hurricane slammed into the island. But the girl, her family, and miraculously, their plantation were spared. The specter of the dead lover had voiced a warning from beyond the grave. It was not to be the last time. One of the next recorded sightings of the Gray Man took place on Pawleys Island at the turn of the century. 
In anticipation of an approaching hurricane, a tenant farmer was herding animals owned by a local family off the island when he encountered the gray man. Hey, mystic, better follow me off the island. There's going to be a storm tonight. I say, follow me off the island. There's going to be a storm tonight. Hey, you crazy man, do what you want. Come on. The following day's hurricane roared right past the family's plantation, sparing it from destruction. The property owned by that family was protected in the hurricane, which is always what happens when the gray man appears to someone. That was in October of 1893. Through, through the years, there have been numbers of different stories, often in the newspaper after a storm. And in 1954, a man who lived in Georgetown but had a summer home at Paula's Island saw the gray man before Hurricane Hazel. His home was so protected that beach towels that they had left hanging on the railing of the porch were still there after the storm. Well, I was here in Hurricane Hazel, so it's very hard for me to believe that beach towels could have remained on that railing and not have been blown away, but they did. In 1954, Hurricane Hazel had left the southern Atlantic coast in ruins. 95 people were killed and over 1,800 homes were destroyed. For the next 35 years, the killer winds steered clear of Pauly's Island, and the gray man came to be perceived by locals as something of a guardian angel. When he appears to you, you're very blessed and fortunate. Your house will be saved. And so I think um, it's strange how people seem to have a sense of fear about ghosts, and yet the gray man is a benign and kindly person who helps people when he comes and appears to them. Midnight. September 22nd, 1989. After laying waste to the Caribbean, Hurricane Hugo slammed into the coast of South Carolina. Its winds ripped through the coastline at speeds in excess of 135 miles per hour. Thousands were forced to flee their homes. In South Carolina alone, there was close to $5 billion worth of damage. Over 9,000 homes were destroyed. Pawnee's Island was particularly hard hit. Well, it looked like a giant dump pile. Chairs, couches, ice boxes, all that stuff was piled up in the middle of the road. Uh, it was terrible. It practically destroyed Paula's Island. It destroyed 14 houses in our section. Ours was left standing. Amazingly, even though the entire neighborhood was destroyed, the Moore's home was virtually unscathed. As we went in, I was so happy to find everything just like I had left it. The papers that we had on the counter were still there, even though the front door had blown open. There was no evidence of any water or anything inside, and the house was intact. Even the, uh, the little pictures and things were still on the refrigerator. They weren't, uh, weren't even blown off. The salt and pepper shakers were still on the counter, and Little things that I had left around were still there. The devastation to the rest of the homes on the island brought about local speculation as to the gray man's whereabouts. Caught up in the aftermath of the hurricane, Jim and Clara Moore had completely forgotten about a haunting encounter that occurred two days before Hugo struck. Didn't think much about it until later on when the article came out in the paper, the gray man failed to appear. And then we talked about, well, we had seen him. Hard to walk in the sand, isn't it? <laughs> we were taking a walk late in the afternoon, which we usually do. And uh, you see so many people walking on the beach at this time of the day. That particular afternoon, we only saw the one. And he was coming directly toward us. When I got within speaking distance, I decided, well, you always speak to people, whether you know them or not. So I raised my hand to say, uh, hi, or beautiful evening, or beautiful night, or whatever. 
and uh, he disappeared. Where did he go? I don't know how to explain it because it's an eerie thing like that, you know. Uh, but of course, I didn't worry too much about it because I said, well, I was just seeing things, but I'm sure that he was there. And when I started to speak, he wasn't there, so. I didn't know it was a gray man. I just thought it was someone on the beach until he disappeared. And then that set us to thinking. I can't explain our good fortune except through the presence of the gray man and the Lord, of course. We may have used the gray man, but I know our house was saved. I can't think of any way that you could rationalize the saving of our house, except it had to be a miracle. I never did believe too much in ghosts. I have changed my outlook. I believe there, there are ghosts. After seeing a ghost, you gotta believe it, you know. It is said that every legend has some basis in truth. According to the story, the gray man ended his tenure on Earth with an urgent mission unaccomplished, his great love irretrievably lost. Yet some say he unknowingly walks the sands of Pauly's Island, still searching for a woman who has been in her grave for over a century. It is somehow inspiring to contemplate a love so strong as to defy death. But if these witnesses are to be believed, then the gray man's personal tragedy has led to others' salvation. And to those whose homes and lives he has helped to save, the only real tragedy is that they cannot give the gray man a heartfelt thank you. Next, the strange case of a young and successful stockbroker who vanished in the New Mexico desert. The desert that stretches across Arizona and New Mexico has been a part of Native American myth and legend for centuries. Many believe it is a source of mystical power, a spiritual vortex where natural beauty and supernatural energy mysteriously merge. In 1988, this picturesque but unforgiving wilderness became the setting for a real life mystery. It all began on Halloween two years ago. Dawn, October 31st. 140 miles east of Tucson, Arizona, local farmer Larry Rivers encountered a young stranger who claimed to be searching for the beast. It was pretty cold that morning. I come driving out my road, and this guy was walking out here in a short sleeve shirt, a pair of shorts on, carrying a stick in his hand. Hello, you lost? No, I'm not lost. What are you doing out here? I'm looking for the beast. And I told him he wasn't going to yeah, find the beast the out, out here. here. He told me he'd find it. Well, I'm going I'm to keep looking. You need a ride somewhere? No, no. I thought it was weird. The stranger was later identified as 29-year-old David Stone. He has not been seen or heard from in two years. David Stone was a highly successful stock market analyst who ran a branch of his father's business in La Jolla, California. But about four years ago, David expressed a desire to change his life and became increasingly involved with a New Age movement. The term New Age encompasses a variety of religious beliefs and philosophies that promote self-enlightenment and spiritual growth. Many followers believe that they can tap into a universal energy through the use of crystals, pyramid power, and meditation. But in this case, David Stone's unyielding obsession with a newfound spirituality may have sent him on a journey from which there is no return. Well, I think he could best be described as an um, overachiever in just about every way. You've never met a kinder, gentler young man than him, very close to family. But then on the other hand, you put him in a football uniform and he was like a proverbial commando. For years, David struggled with this dual nature. Hey, I said don't be doing that. What's your problem, man? On October 28, 1988, during a party at his apartment, David temporarily lost control. Hey, what's going on? David started hitting him. 
he said he might have hit him, oh, 20, 25 times, and he didn't really hurt him, but uh, felt like he had to do that. Roughly around 9 o'clock in the morning, he came down and told me what he had done. Uh, where are you going? Oh, I'm not sure. Grand Canyon, Sonora Desert, Sedona. David told John that he needed to get away to reflect on his explosive behavior. He said he would return home in a few days. Take care of yourself. Okay. Later. Later. Five days later, David's car was discovered on a desolate stretch of New Mexico Highway 80. When we hadn't heard from him, we called the New Mexico State Police, and his car had been found abandoned, and they had towed it in. Police interviewed local residents and learned that several had seen David. We had left our home in Cotton City and were driving up to the ranch. As we went by, we saw this young man, and we thought perhaps he'd had car trouble. So we stopped. Hi. Hi. Are you okay? Are you no. Car no, I'm OK. Thank you. And so we just went on. <laughs> I heard this voice, and I seen this man walking across the way there. Thought it was uh, unusual that he'd be going out across the desert at that time of the year in shorts with no coat or anything, you know. David's car was found near the Pyramid Mountain Range. Pyramids are an integral part of New Age philosophy, and each year many believers come here to experience what are known as vision quests. According to New Age philosophy, a vision quest is an introspective journey taken in order to discover one's inner self. It is believed that through isolation and meditation, a person can experience a vision which will reveal their true identity. I am convinced that once he arrived at that location, that he felt like this would be the perfect starting point for whatever vision quest he personally felt that he had to embark on. There's quite a process of preparation. In that process, you have to face what they term as being the beast. this beast is that evil or negativism which is in you and is the object that must be faced by every person and conquered before you can reach this state of oneness with God. Four days after his son's car was discovered, Harry Stone joined a full-scale manhunt launched by the Boot Heel Search and Rescue Team. For three days, they scoured the desert, using four planes and more than 40 trackers and volunteers on the ground. David's trail headed northwest from his car in the direction of Granite Peak. We thought it was interesting because that mountain from the south looks kind of pyramid shaped. It has an interesting look to it that might have meant something to his religion, it might not have. One half mile from the highway, Searchers discovered the first in a series of bizarre clues left by David. That's when they found a large pyramid up in that wash. It had been made out of sand, mounded up, yeah, and rocks on the corner. The that was the first thing we found. After I got further down the canyon, it seemed like the tracks were real fresh. I had a, a real strange feeling the hair stood up on my arms, and I had a, an intense feeling that he was sitting watching me. Come here. Did you find something? On the second day, trackers discovered here. another puzzling clue. What in the 
Once again, David had erected a small pyramid, but this time he left behind his gold Rolex watch and two quarters. I wonder how come he left his watch here. I don't know what that means. Must be something to do with his religion. The coins in David's watch were found here, about one quarter mile from the first pyramid. Approximately three miles to the north, another puzzling clue was discovered. 13, 18. Searchers came upon a strange sequence of numbers written in the sand. They later learned that these numbers are called the Fibonacci series and are used by stock market analysts the world over. But the last number in the sequence should have been 21. Oddly, David wrote 18. He knew better than that. So it's one of the mysteries, is why would he write 18 instead of 21? Uh, but that goes along with a lot of other uh, unanswered questions. It's real rare for a person to be out as long as he probably was without ever losing a gum wrapper or without ever finding any sign where they slept, where they ate, any, any sign of that kind of stuff we never found. The Stones now feel that the number 18 may have been David's way of telling them he was in trouble. Ironically, his car was found at mile marker 18, and during his senior year in college, David's football jersey number was 18. By the final day of the search, the elements had all but obliterated David's footprints. However, bloodhounds were able to track his scent over the rocky desert terrain. They funneled it back to Highway 80. When they came to the intersection of Interstate 10, David's trail suddenly stopped, approximately 13 miles north of where his car was found. At the time, we took it to be a hopeful sign that he had hitchhiked out or that somebody had given him a ride, and that was the only thing we could understand that would mean why the scent disappeared like it did. Well, I just kept feeling that everything was there to let us know what had happened, but we just weren't seeing it. At the conclusion of the search, Carol and Harry Stone made a more extensive inventory of the items left in David's car. Tucked away in a pocket version of the New Testament, they found a business card bearing the name of a Tony Ballesteros and an Arizona phone number. They immediately contacted Ballesteros. I never met David Stone myself. But uh, the possible way if you could have gotten my card, as I placed it on a mesquite tree for my other friends to find our campsite, maybe the wind blew it down, he picked it up later. At this point, nothing makes sense how my card got into his Bible, to tell you the truth. Put that over there. In addition to the business card, the Stones found a strangely worded note. The note said, they think the word is in the safe. Six knives in Rob's room. Use buys your tea and use takes your chances. Halloween. We don't know what the word tea means. We think it's the old saying, you know, you buy your ticket and you take your chances, but uh, it just said use buys your tea and you take your chances. Halloween. And that was the day he disappeared, which was October 31st, Halloween. What is the meaning behind the strange clues that David left across the desert? Were they a coded message that he was in trouble? Or were they a sign of his ultimate destination? It seems apparent that David managed to walk out of the desert. But what became of him after he reached the intersection of Highway 80 and Interstate 10? There are always those unanswered questions. You know, life has to go on. It's very difficult at times. We would always want him to feel free to contact us and let him know that we love him and would want to hear from him. But we, you know, we face the possibilities.
When we return, the story of a woman named Katie who has reportedly demonstrated bizarre psychic abilities that defy explanation. You're about to meet a woman named Katie. According to witnesses, Katie can predict the future and materialize objects out of thin air. She has supposedly written perfect medieval French while in a trance. A surprising accomplishment for a person who claims that she never learned to read or write. Throughout history, many have claimed to possess psychic powers, but have been exposed as clever fakes using sleight of hand. Is Katie gifted with eerie paranormal abilities, or is she just a talented magician with extraordinary powers of illusion? You be the judge. I'll see people that ain't there. You know, I hear voices that no one else hears. Objects coming from eyes, ears, nose, mouth, you know, just popping out. I've seen her take uh, forks, spoons, nails, anything like that, and by doing this, she could take two fingers and you could watch it droop. I saw Katie's face go from nothing there to the diamond start to come out of her eye. Katie is a great classical physical medium, a psychic who has the ability, or apparently the ability is a gift, which she has, where things happen which are unexplainable, physical things, mind over matter, seeds germinating, things moving without reason, things appearing and disappearing, and all kinds of prophecy, all kinds of things, both mental and physical phenomena. Katie says that her odd experiences began in 1974. She was 25 years old. I was cleaning in my kitchen, and this man opens the door, and he comes in and proceeds to go back to my bedroom. I thought it was the guy that we were renting from. So I go back to the bedroom to, to see what he wants. And when I get back there, there's nobody there. So I'm thinking, well, you know, God, I'm losing it. You know, I've seen this man walk in my door, back to my bedroom. My windows are locked. There's no way out, and he's not there. Several days later, Katie's husband brought home a family photo album, which Katie claims she had never seen before. That's him. That's the man I saw. That's my dad. He had a picture of him. And I said, well, this is the man that opened the door. And he says, it can't be. He said, that's my dad. I'd never, never seen the picture of his dad. And his dad had died maybe five years before we had ever, ever met. My view myself was very skeptical when it comes to psychics. So. I view myself as very skeptical anyway. Uh, if I can't see something that's uh, quite tangible, I, I just don't believe it. And uh, in this particular case, we've seen some, uh, some things that were uh, quite astounding that uh, I can't explain. Jerry Burr is a retired police investigator who has enlisted Katie's help on several occasions. In one burglary investigation, Burr withheld the location of the crime scene from Katie. That's it. That's the house. This is the house here? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the, that's the right one. According to Burr, Katie not only found the house, she described the oriental art inside and said that something had been stolen from a box in a blue room. As we walked in in the entryway, it was all oriental art. Uh, walked into the room that the, the bedroom that the items were taken from, and it turned out the bedroom was blue as well. Uh, she had said it was taken from a box, and sure enough, the items that were taken were from a cherry wood box. Um, didn't know what to think at first. Uh, because she was so dead on, and because I am quite skeptical, I started looking at Katie as a good suspect. Uh, I just wasn't aware that, uh, you know, she was that good. Fifteen minutes later, Katie had another premonition. Well, as we left the house, we were driving back around, and I I kept smelling this, this odor. I smell marijuana. I don't, I don't smell anything, kid. Stop the car. 
this is where it's strongest. And he says, well, what direction is it coming from now? And I said, from the water there. So we walked up on this lake dock. And he asked me if I could still smell it. And I told him yes. And he asked me kind of jokingly, he says, well, do you know when this stuff is going to come in here? She said that in two weeks that uh, we would have this marijuana would come up on the beach. Uh, two weeks, almost to the hour, uh, we had 25 bales of marijuana wash up on the beach. The marijuana washed ashore only a few hundred yards from where Katie had sensed the distinctive smell. However, police confirmed that marijuana shipments had often been recovered in the same area. Was Katie's prediction a true display of psychic powers or just a lucky guess? Psychics make general predictions, and it's difficult to confirm them. I don't think, on the basis of what I've seen, that Miss Katie has any special powers. Uh, uh, surely not. Professor psychic. Paul Kurtz has spent 15 uh, no, years no, investigating no. the unverified claims I of the think, paranormal. Uh, she may have the powers of persuasion, but I don't know that there's anything mysterious about what she's done or what she claims to do. Seems like it's coming out of my face a lot. Stick your tongue out, please. Katie's yeah, abilities, however, time. extend beyond the psychic realm. The most astounding manifestations are physical. Katie has been videotaped by her psychiatrist, sweating what appears to be gold foil out of the pores of her skin. It comes out all over my body. Face, eyes, ears, mouth, arms, thighs, tummy, back, wherever I gotta pores, this is where it comes out at. It's getting larger, it seems to me. Katie has supposedly exuded the foil more than 100 times. Psychiatrist Bertolt Schwarz has examined her during some of these episodes. Miss Katie has the ability, apparently, of having a metallic, gold-like metal foil form on her body and sometimes on objects nearby. For example, a framed picture of her late mother and this gold-like foil will appear on the borders of the picture, on the frame. More likely, the gold, using the words loosely, will appear on her cheeks, under the eyes, the abdomen, the forearms. Here we have something which is a medical marvel. I saw the gold on her tongue first. As Dr. Schwartz was taking the gold off, he had to actually peel it off with a, a tweezer-like instrument. And then I looked down at her arm, and I was holding her hand. And there was nothing on her arm at all. And then she had these long strips of gold that resembled candy kiss uh, wrapping. As we were sitting in a room with Katie, uh, Katie had picked up the front of her blouse, and gold flakes were covering her entire stomach area. And after it was brushed off with her shirt still in the open position, more gold flakes appeared. Eyewitnesses insist that these incidents were not faked and that the gold foil appeared before their eyes. A laboratory analysis of the material reveals it to be 80% copper and 20% zinc. I don't think there's any objective hard evidence that this is uh, exuding from her pores, more, more, most likely point is someone wants other people to believe this, and so they put this metallic paper on them. Two of Professor Kurtz's colleagues were able to simulate Katie's alleged abilities using ordinary metallic foil. Okay, so this is what we did. We went to a regular art store in Buffalo. We bought something called gold leafing. It's very thin strips of foil colored gold. And, um, then the I chemical the composition of the foil closely resembles that of Katie's and foil. I put the foil on in thin strips, Kathy helped me. And then I sprayed hairspray on it so it would stick. And it's been stuck for four hours since 11 this morning. And I have some on my tongue. And I can still talk and swallow sometimes. <laughs> and then I put it on my stomach. And then I put it on my back. If somebody come up to me and said, well, Hey, I know this person that's got the stuff that comes out of their skin, you know, it's gold. You know, I really have seen this. I would think it was a trick. Until I've seen it myself, I would, I would believe that it, you know, well, 
what are they doing? You know, how are they getting this on them? Or, you know, what kind of magic are they doing? I would believe it was fake till I saw it. I'm, I'm here, Kate. I put the hair out of the way. Even more unbelievable are Katie's apparent powers of apportation, where solid objects seem to appear out of her mouth, nose, or ears. This videotape taken by her psychiatrist shows what appears to be a gold charm emerge from the vicinity of her ear. This tape was also shot by Dr. Schwartz and shows a glass stone resembling a diamond apparently materializing out of Katie's eye. It might look as though she's going to throw up or cough, cough away, and out pops a gem of some kind right out of the mouth. Now, prior to that, the mouth and throat was examined very carefully. There was nothing there. She sipped some water and swallowed, so nothing was secreted, which it's hard to see how it could be anyway in the stomach. So you have to ask the question, where did this thing come from? Are these examples of apportation merely skillful sleight of hand? This footage has been slowed down to take a closer look. In these frames, we can see the object emerge from above her ring. As soon as we saw the apportation, we decided we would get a magician in here who has attended our meetings and worked with us in the past to see if he could duplicate what she has done. And he did that. I assume that at the point when she actually caused the gem to appear. She had the, the gem palmed in her hand, just like this, palm between her fingers. It's a very comfortable place, and you can gesture convenient, comfortably, and nobody uh, suspects anything. And then when she reached her hand up to her eye, it was a simple matter to spread her fingers apart. And you can see them spreading apart as the gem falls through, just like that. Is Katie a brilliant fraud? If so, it seems odd that she has never attempted to profit in any way from her abilities. But could Katie truly be marked with paranormal powers? Where does something like this fit into my thinking? It doesn't. It's, uh, it's beyond me. It's beyond my comprehension. I was a doubting Thomas, too. But um, if you saw it, you, too, would be a believer. I've learned to accept it a little bit more now than what I did in the beginning. But I do still have questions in my mind that are not answered yet. And I don't know if they will be answered, but I'm gonna keep trying till I find out. Next, a surprising update on our story of reincarnation. Can two lovers from the past be reunited? Reincarnation, life after death, has fascinated people and cultures all over the world for centuries. Last season, we presented the eerie story of a woman named Georgia Rudolph, who is convinced that she is the reincarnation of a girl who lived at the turn of the century. Tonight, a surprising update on Georgia's bizarre story. Since childhood, Georgia has been beset by recurring dreams and memories of an unfamiliar earlier time. Visions of horses and carriages, a river, and repeatedly old-fashioned stern wheels. Often there is a young man dressed in a brown suit and derby hat, and always the image of a dark-haired girl. My whole childhood, I thought I was crazy, because I don't think there was a month that went by that I didn't have either memories or dreams. So we're going to go Continually the haunted by these images, that, well, Georgia sought therapy in the form of regressive hypnosis. That you've been dreaming about and thinking about. When Georgia first contacted me, I felt it might be something like an early traumatic childhood memory that she was trying to remember. Or possibly it could be an aspect of a multiple personality. Uh, other than that, the reincarnation was probably the last thing in my mind about what had happened to her. Under hypnosis, Georgia began to give detail to her visions. She believes the girl in her dreams is named Sandra Jean Jenkins. The young man in the derby hat was her fiancé. His name was Tommy Hicks. In 1914, according to George's visions, Tommy Hicks drowned in the Ohio River. 
His body was never found. Sandra Jean Jenkins was left unmarried and pregnant with Tommy's child. Distraught over the death of Tommy and unable to face the shame that their unborn child would bring, Sandra Jean Jenkins took her own life. Georgia began searching for the people and places she saw in her dreams. In 1984, she journeyed to Marietta, Ohio, where she met with the reporter Ted Bauer. Ted is a lifelong resident of Marietta and worked for the local newspaper for 32 years. When George arrived in Marietta, I said, I'll take you around and show you some of the places that you talked about over the phone. And she says, no, I'll show you where to go. I couldn't believe her knowledge of Marietta. I can't buy the reincarnation bit, but she has some kind of power, some way of knowing what happened in the past. In a nearby town, Georgia located a house she says matches the house in her visions. Relatives of the former owner gave Georgia what she feels is evidence that Sandra Jean Jenkins did exist. They brought out a picture taken in 1908. And the girl that I call Sandra is standing in that picture. There was a statement made by a member of the family. I don't know this girl's name, but I know she drowned out back of the house. Georgia's story is difficult to accept. But there are so many coincidences that we cannot simply dismiss it out of hand. After our broadcast, we learned of another equally baffling coincidence. A 36-year-old college professor who had never met Georgia Rudolph claims that over a year before our broadcast, he underwent hypnosis and had a past life experience in which he recalled that he was a young man living in Ohio at the turn of the century named Tommy Hicks. When I saw the original segment with Georgia Rudolph, I could just feel the anxiety building in myself because there was almost instant recognition. And my wife was watching me and thinking, what's wrong with him? And I was gripping the arm of the couch tighter and tighter and tighter as we went through. And then when she finally, when Georgia F Rudolph finally said, you know, that his name was Tom Hicks, I almost fell off the couch. Our broadcast aired in February 1990. In September of 1988, Jack Turnock underwent regressive hypnosis with Dr. Bruce Crystal in Jacksonville, Florida. The particular session that I went through, I was taken back to uh, turn of the century Ohio, I and uh, I told the interviewer that my name was Tom Hicks. While under hypnosis, Jack said that a river seemed to play a large part in the life of Tommy Hicks, and that Tommy's younger brother had drowned. Jack also recalled that Tommy Hicks had a girlfriend with long, dark hair. I still remain somewhat skeptical. I need more proof. But we're getting closer and closer to the point where we cannot excuse it on the basis of chance or probability. I think Jennifer. In September, Jennifer Jack Turnoff traveled to Macon, Georgia, and underwent okay. regressive hypnosis Is with Dr. Douglas Smith. During the session, Dr. Smith asked Jack several key questions in order to determine if he could have in any way fabricated the events he described while under hypnosis two years earlier. Hair's pulled back, but it's as long as We have asked him to compare the reincarnation experience that he had with something that did not occur to him, and he could make the distinction. In my professional opinion, I am quite certain that he was telling the truth. Boat was stuck. I was skeptical before the two regression sessions that I've had, but if they're not true, then there's an awful lot of very odd coincidences going on. Something very definite is going on, but we have no rational explanation that science can provide as to what's happening. I suggest we keep an open mind. The stories of Georgia Rudolph and Jack Turnock are indeed hard to believe. But keep in mind, many of the world's religions accept reincarnation as a basic part of their beliefs. For the rest of us, the possibility of life after death, however hopeful, remains an unsolved mystery.
next week on Unsolved Mysteries. 55 years ago, aviatrix Amelia Earhart was the most famous woman in America. In 1937, she left Oakland, California to fly around the world. Six weeks later, her plane went down in the South Pacific. Today, evidence from the remote island of Saipan suggests that Amelia Earhart was captured by the Japanese and may have been executed. In Woodstock, Illinois, a high school romance turns sour and ends in tragedy for 17-year-old Colleen Ritter. Perhaps you can help capture her missing boyfriend who is wanted for murder. Also a special appeal from the musical group New Kids on the Block. Three years ago, 16-year-old Carrie Nixon disappeared. In June 1989, she may have been spotted at New Kids concert in Los Angeles. Join me next week for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.